If you ever saw the text messages your teenage children sent each other on their cell phones, you might be shocked. But imagine if those messages were used as hardcore evidence in a murder trial. We've all heard the warnings about don't text and drive, and we've done stories on it here. But until now, we don't think a teenager's text has ever been seen like this. And the car she's driving while texting, is that the murder weapon itself? Here's Deborah Roberts. She's the picture of a fresh-faced teenager. Yet Justine Winter is about to learn whether something she did at age 16 will land her in prison for decades. It all started more than two years ago on a late winter evening in the Flathead Valley of northern Montana. Justine is dropping off her boyfriend at his home. At the same time, local resident Richard Peppel is in his car too, heading home. And at Kalispell Middle School, Erin Thompson has just watched her 13-year-old son, Caden, perform in a school concert. He was in jazz band. Drums was his big passion. Caden's grandmother, Diana Johnson. Well, how was he as a little teenager? High energy, very intelligent boy. He was one of three students that was asked to play at this concert, so Aaron was attending that concert with him that night. Aaron begins the drive home, aglow with pride for her teenage son and with something else. She found a later in life true love, Jason Thompson. I knew when I met Aaron, knew she knew my heart and I knew hers. It was right from the start we were in love with each other. The two soon marry and begin a life together. Three years later, a baby is on the way. I didn't want anything more than just to raise family together. And to know that I was going to be with her for the rest of my life was, it was the culmination of all my dreams, really. It's just past 8 p.m. when Aaron, now four months pregnant, and Caden, her son from a previous relationship, pull north onto Highway 93. Unbeknownst to Aaron, driving in the opposite direction is Justine, a popular straight-A student. She was smart. She was pretty outgoing. She really liked to talk to people and make new friends. Desiree Landon grew up with Justine, sharing good times and grown-up dreams, like learning to drive. For her 16th birthday, Justine had just gotten a car. How excited was Justine about having a car and her license? Oh, we were so excited. We were stoked. But Desiree had concerns about her friend's new boyfriend, 17-year-old Ryan Langford. His relationship with Justine would come to matter more than anything else that night. Was Justine's relationship with Ryan a positive one? Was it a good one from what you could see? No. Why do you say that? Because she wasn't hanging out with like any of her friends. She spent all of her time with him. She was a different person. She wasn't, she was all about Ryan. Justine was in love, or so she thought. She and Ryan kept each other's pictures on their cell phones. But on this evening, they're arguing over an entry in Justine's journal about an old boyfriend. Ryan is angry and jealous, Justine terrified of losing him. Their fight escalates even as she heads home because she's doing something she and her friends know they shouldn't, texting while driving. Justine ignores those warnings and starts sending Ryan a flurry of frantic text messages. Goodbye, Ryan. I'm telling the truth when I tell you I love you. My last words, I love you, Ryan. He responds, yeah, whatever you say, you win, I lose. With each minute, her text turned more hysterical. If I won, I would have you and I wouldn't crash my car. And this, it's ending. Bye, Ryan. On the dark road, there's construction, and the highway is now down to two lanes. As she nears the Stillwater Bridge, her teen romance spinning out of control, Justine is now barreling at 85 miles an hour. Just then, Aaron Thompson and Caden are coming the other way. Richard Peppel is right behind them. He'll never forget what he saw next. I'm going, geez. What did I just see? Did you have even time to sort of react? I mean, it just exploded. Kaboom. Peppo rushes to the tangled wreckage of the closest car, Justine Winters. Her tongue had gone back into her uh, esophagus. 
I just pulled that out, and then the, the white foam and the blood came out pretty profusely, and, and I didn't think she was going to make it. He then races to the other car, where pregnant Erin and her 13-year-old son are trapped inside. When I got there, I pulled the door open. She, she was trying to tell me something. He would later wonder if she was struggling to get help for her son, buried in the wreckage. It, it couldn't come out because her chest was so crushed. And she, I know she had internal injuries. And I held her hand and I said, we got help on the way, just hang in there. But she didn't. Finally, she just blinked out. I just all of a sudden had this dread that something was wrong. And I having to call up the hospitals or the police department and just try to find out if there was an accident. Jason is finally connected to police. And he, and he said, I so much didn't want to tell you this on the phone, but Aaron and Caden were killed in an accident. I've never been so wrecked. It's like, I lost my heart, I lost my life, I lost my entire family. Incredibly, Justine is alive. She's pulled from the wreckage, then airlifted to a Seattle hospital, her mother Mary by her side. I don't know how many pints of blood they put on her. They worked on her the whole way there and pumped more blood in her. And I sat and rubbed her feet. I said, we're fine, honey. Back in Montana, Patrol Sergeant Ernie Freeberry begins the investigation. So we had a lot of questions on why the winner's vehicle crossed the center line and hit the Thompson vehicle clear over in the far end of her lane. We didn't know why this happened. There had to be a reason. So he questions Justine's boyfriend, Ryan. He said that the two of them had been arguing all night and that Justine thought the two of them were going to break up their relationship. Ryan admits he and Justine were exchanging heated texts in the minutes before the crash. Freeberry and county detectives examine them and see this one sent at 816. That's why I'm going to wreck my car, because I'm a terrible person. I want to kill myself. Goodbye, Ryan. I love you. Just minutes later... We had our first report of the head-on accident on Highway 93. Now we had a very clear answer. Of, this is why it took place. She did just exactly what she said she was going to do. Do you think she would have been capable of trying to take her life? I think so, because when she started dating Ryan, she wasn't the girl that I knew. She wasn't the girl that I grew up with. So there's no doubt in your mind that Justine meant to do this? In my mind, yes. There's no doubt. She's guilty of murder. Deliberate homicide. Longtime county attorney Ed Corrigan. She purposely went into that wrong lane of traffic, ran into that car, and had to know or should have known that by doing so, she was going to kill the occupants in that other vehicle. He decides to indict this 16-year-old as an adult with the most serious charge possible, two counts of deliberate homicide. But Justine has no memory of that night. After nearly seven weeks in the ICU and multiple operations, she comes home to rehab and back to school wearing a neck brace and a court-ordered ankle bracelet. She's not evil. She's a good girl. I know deep in my heart it was an act. Didn't. Justine would never hurt another human being, and she wouldn't hurt herself. Delisa Willis and her daughter Amanda have known Justine all her life. I think that they wanted so desperately to, to have someone to put the blame on to, 